Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Kathleen Drum, and I'm TIFF's Industry Director, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the first of three exclusive sessions we have in partnership with The Guardian. Today, we explore the painfully exquisite love story, Call Me By Your Name. At TIFF, it's, it's very hard to have favourites because we see so many incredible movies. However, Luca Guadagnino's masterful coming-of-age tale of a tender, tentative Italian romance between visiting academic Armie Hammer and Professor's son, Timothy Chalamet, is simply one of the finest films of the year. Call Me By Your Name is about the secrets of youth, the magic of summer, and it's evocative of the faded luster of a treasured memory. Before I introduce our guests, a reminder, please, that um, no photography or video recording is allowed inside the studio. However, we are live streaming to our website and YouTube channel, and please do feel free to tweet using the hashtags on the screen behind me to keep the conversation going with our online audience. Director Luca Guadagnino was born in Palermo, Italy, and studied literature and cinema in Rome. His feature directorial debut, The Protagonists, won the FIDEC Prize at Venice. His credits include Melissa P., The Luminous I Am Love, and A Bigger Splash. Army Hammer's performance as the Winkle Voss twins, the pantomime villains of the social network, garnered him critical praise and awards along with a bevy of fans around the world. He has since appeared in the acclaimed films J. Edgar, The Birth of a Nation and Nocturnal Animals. He stars in the upcoming feature Hotel Mumbai and begins production soon for On the Basis of Sex, opposite Felicity Jones. Timothy Chalamet was born in New York City. This gifted young actor has been recognized for his work on stage and screen, including Interstellar and Hot Summer Nights. He features in two other films screening at TIFF, Lady Bird and Hostiles. He will soon star in Woody Allen's untitled next film, opposite Al Fanning and Selena Gomez. The moderator of today's session is Benjamin Lee, who is The Guardian's East Coast arts editor based in New York. He was formerly part of The Guardian's film team in London, where he hosted the daily podcast and was a regular guest on the film show. Benjamin was previously online editor of Shortlist and has written for Empire, Little White Lies and Vice. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Luca Guadagnino, Armie Hammer, Timothy Chalamet, and Benjamin Lee to the stage. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Oh. So, uh, welcome idea. to Toronto, guys. You've uh, had quite a year of it. I know the film premiered in Sundance to ecstatic reviews, and the buzz seems to have sustained sort of since then. Lots of Oscar talk already. Um, what's interesting, the film has this incredible status now already, but when you watch the film at the start, there are all these production companies and film funds involved. Whenever there's a long list of that at the start of a film, I always think this film wasn't easy to get made. Uh, I'm wondering, Luca, going back to the origins, how hard was it to get people on board with the project? How hard was it to get financing for it? Well, the movie got many reiterations and many incarnations in the making. It was, at the beginning, a different project with a different script. A few ideas on, on directors pop up in the minds of the producers. Peter Spears is somewhere here. Our Rosamund, myself. And, uh, you know, like... Uh, uh, there, always, there, was, there was always some sort of discomfort from the market for a movie like this. Probably, I would say, because of uh, uh, the fact that uh, um, it was a movie that uh, didn't have any real antagonism in, taking place into. And eventually we, we managed to 
make it happen by a virtuosistic collection of, uh, of uh, uh, producers and financiers. And this is a really uh, international film because it has been financed with France, Memento Films, Emily Georges, and Naima uh, Abed. Uh, also, money came from Brazil uh, with the Rodrigo Teixeira company, RT Features. Uh, Italy put money in it, and uh, um, it was really an, an endeavor. It took a lot of time. It was a small budget, really, really small. But eventually, it was made into uh, uh, with the, with a sort of a really light attitude, very really laid back. You you spoke before about falling in love with the actors that you work with. Um, I know you don't really believe in a strict audition process. How do you? How do you find the actors? Is it sort of like a, like a date in a way? Are you sort of sussing them out, getting to know them? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, 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 I work with, always with the same actors, by the way. Um, yes! <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> yeah, I think a, a good old conversation is, the, is a good thing. You talk to people, like... Um, I'm more interested in the personality in front of me than in their skills. I give it for granted that they can act. That doesn't mean anything in a way. It's not like, I, it's very strange when you hear stories about your colleague, my colleague, that they are auditioning someone who has made nine movies, 15 movies. I say, watch the movies if you want to know if she or he can act. Why do you have to audition for the role? I have to see if it's fitting the, the part. Please I think tell every director this, because auditioning <laughs> is the worst. But auditioning is really doesn't mean anything. It's really... It's the personality. It's really the personality. And in fact, I met both many years before making this film. I met him in person after I saw your social network. And I kept watching his films and... And, and it was a mixture of, like, the meeting I had with Army was really wonderful, and I loved him, and it was really, like, fascinating for me. And, and what he was doing as a, as, as a performer was always striking to me. He hates me now, but uh, for what I'm saying. And Timothy, <laughs> I, I met him when... Uh, I think you had done, like, Homeland, mm -hmm. and then you kept making other stuff, but the meeting was great. So I, I collected in me the meetings I had with them, and it's true, I need to fall in love with them. And it's interesting that um, uh, uh, every director is a little bit of a sadist. So it's interesting to give and take, give and take. And, but, you know, it's also a healthy process because you fall in love and then you sublimize on screen instead of wanting them. Because I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> but I mean... Because I read that before, when Army originally was sent the script or told about the project, you'd, you'd said no through your agent, and then you met with Luca, and then you sort of, then you fell in love with the project. What was that conversation like? How powerful must his words have been? Uh, man, it, it's, it's almost so long ago that I don't remember all the details, but I remember... He didn't say no. He, he said he wants to talk to you. So I called him. I mean, I, get, I got a number, and I called you. Yeah. Uh, and then he got the phone, and I was like... I read your script, it's incredible. I don't know if I can do this. Like, I just, I don't know if I have this in me. I don't know, like, this makes me nervous. I feel like this is like a challenge, more so than I've ever been challenged before because of the subtlety of it, because of the intimacy, because of all. There's so much that happens between these two characters that, that is all subtext and all underneath what you actually see. And as an actor, if you don't get it, you can't bring truth and honesty to it. So. I said I wanted to talk on the phone, and we got on the phone, and I was like, listen, dude, I, don't, I just don't know if I can do this. Like, it scares me, but I'm enticed, but also I, I, it just makes me nervous and the whole thing. And we had an amazing conversation, uh, several. And by the end of it, I just remember Luca challenging my sense of perspective and challenging my sense of everything, really, and helping me understand that the reason I had to do this project was because it did make me feel uncomfortable, because it was going to be a challenge, because it was going to push me, it was, like all that stuff. And uh, I, mean, I, I honestly just couldn't be more appreciative. The Maybe. first feature of the Stanley Kubrick that he dismissed later is called Fear and Desire. So I said to him, if you fear something, you're desiring something, so you better do it. 
And he said yes. And then I got a call from the agent. Say, what did you say? It, it, it's not what I said. It's the conversation. Because I, I, I talked to my to agent pass. before him, and I was like, Luke is going to call me in like an hour. He's like, what are you going to do? I was like, I'm going to pass on the movie. I can't do this. And then, uh, and then I finished the conversation. I called my agent, and he's like, what happened? I was like, oh, man, well... I guess we're gonna film it in Crema now, which is great, so I'm going to Crema. And he was like, wait, what? <laughs> you know? yeah. Timothy, you know, you're early in your career, it's such a, it's such a naked performance, literally and, and, and emotionally. Uh, were you ever wary of giving away this much in, in one of your early films? Was it, does it seem like kind of a daunting prospect to you? Oh, you know, <laughs> uh, no, because I, I know what it is to be a part of things that nobody sees and, um, so there, there, you, you know, I wasn't trying to split, split, uh, split pubic hairs trying to find. Um, <laughs> right now, I'm kidding. That's a bad joke. But I'm trying. I wasn't trying to split hairs, uh, trying to uh, figure out uh, whether it was the right move or not. But rather, the vulnerability or physical vulnerability, as you put it, is um, it's implied in the story. It's uh, uh, it's it's a love story. It's it's secondary to the story. The the physical vulnerability, the emotional vulnerability, it, it's in service to, to what is ultimately the relationship between Elio and Oliver. So I think that stuff would have given me greater pause if that was the subject of the movie, which we see in other films that, you know, where they'll, they'll take sexual imagery to a certain extent that's shocking the audience, and that's the star of the movie. And that would have given me a little bit more pause. But certainly this thing is something I, you know, discussed with my parents before I headed out there. This, this is a love story. And it's a really sweet love story where the villain is the tragedy of love. So um, it didn't feel salacious or anything like that. What's fascinating in the film is that the chemistry between the two of you is so electric, and often you see married couples on screen, there's no chemistry at all. Um, and I, I know you met for the first time in Kramer uh, sort of at the start of the production, so there wasn't a, a chemistry test as often happens with actors. How did you work on that as actors? How, how do you create that connection off camera? Where does that come from? Well, you, you know, um, <clears throat> the, the, we, we've been getting asked that, and my, the response is always what the truth is, which is that, that Army and I, we just spent so much time together before we started filming. It, wasn't, it didn't feel like we were consciously making choices to build chemistry, but rather that experience is the greatest teacher. The more time we spent with one another, the, more, the, the closer we would get, the, um, the more the chemistry would be, would be uh, palpable on screen. But something that's coming to me right now that I haven't really thought about before is that without it being oppressive, like, you know, that's what Luca needs for his films. It needs to be real, it needs to be good. We're not gonna move on unless it feels like too, unless it feels like exactly what would be going on in the situation. Army and I were laughing about a thing today earlier at, the, at a press conference we were doing because they were showing the trailer on screen and we saw a scene, we both kind of turned to each other and were like, yeah, that was one of these things that we kind of struggle with really getting to a, an honest portrayal of, but, like I said, the combination of, the experience, of all the time we got to spend with one another and also the, you know, the high standard Luca would hold us to to really make it feel real and committed and, and not like coy or something um, um, that held us to a high standard. Because yeah, Luca, I believe the first scene you had them rehearse was the kiss between the two of them. Was that sort of like a test to sort of throw them in the deep end, talking about being a, a sadist as you were before, to, to see how embarrassed they would be on the initial scene to, to, to go that far? Can I, I'm going to jump in before Luca answers his question and just tell you how that actual rehearsal went down. Uh, it's our first rehearsal. We'd spent... And the uh, only one. The, the only <laughs> rehearsal that we did. So we show up at the villa, which was the house that we shot in, and it's a beautiful villa. And we get there, and, it's, and he shows us around, and he says, do you guys want to... Should we do a little rehearsing? And Tim and I are like, yeah, let's, let's get into it. Like, that's what we're here for. Let's do some rehearsing. He goes, I was like, Great. yes! Uh, yes. yes. Uh. So Luca's like... Okay, well, you know, I mean, I don't really have anything planned. If we want to do a rehearsal, we can just do something random, like, I don't know, scene 62. So we're like, scene 62, absolutely. Flip, 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 flip. And all it says is Elio and Oliver making out. And we're just like, okay. And he's like, come on, we'll go in the backyard and rehearse. And we, so we go in the backyard of the villa, and there's like this grass patch. And he goes, you two just lay down. And, we go, and we did it. Okay. Twice, right? Yeah. So we lay down, and he's like, "Okay, whenever you're ready, go ahead." <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and that was, and then we, uh, Timmy and I rolled around on the grass, made out for a little bit, and before it was even done, Luca goes, okay, that's okay. And then just walked away and like left us laying on the grass. Yeah. <laughs> and we did also camera test. Yeah, yeah, In which yeah, I right. put the heads yeah, once. Yeah, yeah. It's nice to tease people, it's very nice. <laughs> It's very, very nice. <laughs> but I was more tough in the uh, non-sexual scenes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, no, it's, you were uh, quite tough? I was more tough when we were. Mm -hmm. It's fine, it's fine, it's nice. <laughs> They're great, I love them, they're fantastic. The film really captures this <laughs> sort of remarkable male intimacy and there's, there's so many scenes you see and you kind of feel as if you're alone watching the film, you're, you're in the corner of the room, it, it feels very personal and, and, and small. How do you, as a director, engender that atmosphere? Do you try and strip down the crew? Do you make it feel quite casual? What's the trick to making uh, it feel so personal? I think that I, honestly, I really don't, I just don't make any kind of hierarchy in the scenes we're shooting. Every scene is important. Sometimes I like a small moment that is not even written in the script is much more important than something that is a big scene. But, uh, so for me, it's like, Everything is an important element of the story. Uh, the, I, I guess it's also the like now. My, you're making me think about the fact that it's been 25 years making this job, um, and I've been carrying this. We are gypsies. Like we like to, we we travel the world and we we always put the tent on the on the field and we camp, and then we move on to the next thing. But I constantly carry with me people that I want to work with and I want to share my life with. So it's an atmosphere that comes off of this relationship, like same people I'm working since 25 years. And I think this sense of family that we all share is transmitted to new members of the family, and we are a family, uh, making something uh, um, uh, because we love the idea of making it. Uh, so I think that uh, um, I think this element of atmosphere that it's not necessarily plot, it's something that happens to be. It's something that also put people at ease, the people are, who are in front of the camera, but also the people behind the camera. It's like, it's a mutual conversation. You had both great relationship, for instance, with the DP, like Isayu mm -hmm. Bumuk Diprom, this masterful director of photography from Thailand who had made these great films by Uncle the venerable Abhi Chaptong, Vera Satekul, uh, coming from a completely different culture, um, um, having different priorities in mind and in his life, was in a way a sort of shifting personality in the, in the, in the set for the best. So it's, it's, it's an island of uh, serendipity and familiarity that helps things to be without any kind of... That's why I feel difficult for me. It is to give up control in my work because probably it's this environment that I treasure the most. And I fear, uh, not even fear, I, I just, I'm not interested in an, any other kind of environment for my work. And it was filmed in your hometown as well, so mm. it must have been strange bringing a production to your, to your home, essentially. I can tell you two things. One thing is was great because we were, I, can, I could go back to my bedroom and sleep in my bed, <laughs> which is great because usually hotels and stuff and eat bad food. And on the other hand, I thought it was nice. It was great to go to Crema and bring a film crew and bring money to the, to the territory. They hated us. <laughs> they hated us. They were really like, oh, well, who's these people? What, they are blocking streets and squares and stuff? Now they love us, but anyway. <laughs> I love the t-shirt, pitch me. Hey. <laughs> uh -huh. Nice. It's impossible to watch the film without thinking about your own experiences of love and sex for the first time and previous relationships, and I certainly did after I saw it. And as actors, you have this film in your head and in your life for a few months. Do you reminisce as well? Do you go back to experiences that it, it recalls for you as well? Or is it dangerous to get too far into your own uh, ideas rather than the characters? Well, we were kind of asked this earlier, and it kind of gave me pause, and I really had to think about it. And the truth is, I've been lucky to have something like this, but I haven't had this fiery experience that was boundaryless within a summer. So there wasn't the danger for me in doing the project, like, as you mentioned on other things where you're dealing with material that's close to self and you're going, oh God, this is, where do you draw that line? This was uh, 
I got to kind of live it for the first time. Um, this wasn't something um, that I had experienced, so. Yeah, I'm personally for me as well. I, I'd, I'd never had. I mean, I've, I've had great summer experiences and great romances and all that stuff, but never anything like this. So there wasn't anything in my life that I could actually pull from. But at the same time, that's. <clears throat> I like that better. Uh, I don't. I don't want to be making a movie and be in the middle of a scene where I'm doing a scene with Timmy and present in whatever we're doing in Crema or in the villa in Moscatzano or wherever we were, thinking about what happened to me seven years ago. Because I feel like that would be unfair to Timmy, it would be unfair to Luca. Everybody's got their own different style and their own process, but for me, I leave my own personal experience at the door and it just becomes more about what we're actually doing there. So to bring sort of truth to this was to just be present in this as opposed to thinking about my own experiences. And I know you were saying before you wanted to avoid the trappings of acting as a director with your, with your, with your performers. What do you mean by that? You, you sort of want to strip them down to stop acting and just to be, essentially? Well, like, uh, things are, m movies are made on malls, particularly in the last few decades. And you read a script and it's like, three acts, something happens to the character that, that has to go to the f end of the first act, so that the second act is going to evolve the things until you end the second act with a big problem, and then at the end, the thing's going to be solved, or it's going to be sad, or whatever. And then you have like uh, um, casual dialogue in the first act, then it's going to become an open dialogue between characters, and end up in big monologues. This is, for me, a travesty, and I hate it. Hmm. But that's how 99% of the, the fare that is given to us in cinemas works. You can uh, agree on this, correct? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so for me, that is what is a, a poison to the, experience, to the movie experience. Because we, we, we uh, make the effort of, of having this very beautiful and uh, uh, important experience of uh, going to the movies in a... In a in an environment in which we all share con in, con in together the experience of watching other people's life because we want to be surprised and because we want to be given insights of, of what, something that is close to us or that brings in a different place, but yet from, from a perspective of truth. And uh, so for me, it's really important that we don't serve uh, to the performers a tool, a script that is about uh, them uh, reading lines, addressing lines, uh, make, being, being thespian. I hate this word, thespian. I think it's disgusting. I, I, I much <laughs> rather prefer the idea that they try to, as he said, to be present in the moment and then behave as if they were the characters and maybe some, and revealing something about themselves, which doesn't mean that they reveal uh, uh, either uh, something about their past or that they have to be uh, making, be coinciding with what the character are, but it's more about the emotion in the eyes, I think, that sparkle, that invisible sparkle. You were saying before the film doesn't really have an antagonist as well, and that sort of fits into what you were saying, in that you watch Many the people, film many, many financiers were telling me, make the mother mean. But you expect and I said, viewer. that's superior. Sorry? <laughs> You expect it as a viewer, you know, I kept on expecting there to be a scene where everything blew up when someone found out or someone was upset and it doesn't really arrive and as a viewer you're surprised but ultimately it makes it feel like it's, it's a real situation rather than a construct. Um, and there's a wonderful scene near the end that everyone's been talking about with Michael St uh, Stolberg um, where he speaks to his son and, and talks about acceptance, uh, uh, having a, a gay kid, and it's something we don't often see. Um, and the film's not a political or, or a preachy film but it seems to be coming at a time when it's a message which is hugely important for people to be, to be seeing. And not that you made this film with a message, but do you hope at the moment, especially in America, that it's going to maybe provide a bit of insight into some people? To I think it's the movie, uh, in a way, the political aspect of this movie can be build bridges, don't build walls, I think. Hmm. I think generally it feels like we're in a kind of aggressive, regressive time as well for LGBTQ rights, especially in America. With the film now, uh, what do you see it sort of saying about the, the LGBT experience, or do you see it as being, a, I know you've said before that it's a universal love story, but how do you see it sort of 
speaking to the LGBTQ community? What do you want me to say? Well, I think there is a severe backlash against uh, 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 the experience of the civil rights that uh, rose out of the 50s and the 60s, both in America and in Europe. And uh, it's interesting that there is a sort of vengefulness against that. Uh, like welfare state in, in Europe is severely being diminished and broken down to its basics by uh, this uh, uh, violent and aggressive neoconservatorism, neoliberalism. And in America, uh, the great experience that is, came out of the civil rights battles, uh, both in the uh, f um, in the 50s and in the 60s for the um, um, sexual liberation to the um, African-American experience is now uh, in a way that is really dangerous and worrying, um, swapped into a sort of general consensus that uh, um, that doesn't work anymore and we have to move on onto a new ground. And I think that uh, <coughs> the, the, the attitude of this movie in a way it's saying, no, 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 no. We have to be really affirming the, ab the ability of being true to ourselves and to meet the other in its otherness and, and loving the alien, as Woody, uh, sorry, David Bowie say, sang. Um, uh, so on this ground, uh, uh, and in my imagery, um, the politics that have that has been they became LGBTQ politics, and in my experience, they always been in a way the the experience of uh, uh, the difference and the experience of the unexpected and the experience of the un, un something you can't put into a box is a, is a, is a, is a pivotal experience. It's a, a pillar of our imagery and mine in particular. There's a, um, a lot of Oscar buzz about the film Army. I know that you said before recently that you're not really into the idea of campaigning and self-promotion to, to get an award. Um, do you feel that we get to this time of year and that the awards can often overshadow the actual films we're talking about? I'm not stepping on that landmine. Uh, <laughs> what I will tell you is that there is a time of year where a lot of great movies come out and the fact that there's a lot of fanfare around them and the fact that you have to do what you have to do to promote and do whatever is all just kind of part and parcel with the business. I'm thrilled to be here to support Timmy and to support Luca and to support this film, which I believe in. And Timothy, it's a kind of crazy time of year for you because you have, all of a sudden, you have this film, you have Greta Gerwig's directorial debut, Lady Bird, Scott Cooper's Hostiles, all these things coming at once. How do you prepare for this kind of ubiquity? How do you... How have you been preparing for it? I am so poorly prepared for this. I, I, I don't know, I just, uh, um, I feel like, you know, how often is it the solution to the problem that's the problem and not the problem itself? So I, I, I don't, I, I'm just trying to do this stuff normally. <laughs> I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I mean, actually a better response to that would be, and this is, and I, I, really mean this from the bottom of my heart, is this was like this on set, but certainly for all things publicity now or talking about the film or Q&As afterwards, I got like the best role model in the world to look at, to uh, take after right here because even the way, you, you know, like the question you asked before, like that, you handled that perfectly. So um, um, I'm like a real, uh, uh, a real admirer of how our army does these things. So, so to work with him and, and I guess I just got to do a movie with Steve Carell and the way he carries himself too, these are, these are like titans of the industry. There's a reason why he's, you know, Army and, and uh, Steve, they, they, they work so much. It makes you a little nervous as a young actor because you don't want to be the guy that goes in there and like lights it on fire or something uh, inadvertently. Um. <laughs> well, so when, when you have an experience like this, it sounds like a very intimate family kind of set. Is it quite hard then to work with other directors, you know, after this to then compare experiences to this? Because not every set's going to be as harmonious and as... Perfect as this, I wouldn't have thought. <laughs> Look at Lucas smile. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, this was the... It, it'll be hard for me to have a, an acting experience that was as immersive as this one, because I was out there a month early, and, you know, like, uh, sometimes people, when they speak a different language, they say they assume a different pe personality in that language, and certainly that's true for me when I speak French. And weirdly, just being in that town for three months, I, it, like... It, um, I don't know, it, 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 
it, it, it grew on me, and by the end, I was uh, a version of me I wasn't when I got there. And so to go back to New York after that, it was absolutely surreal, and it's been a struggle to marry these visions ever since. No, but, uh, but um, yeah. There's this nostalgia in the film, but it never feels as if it's been overly done. Often when you see films set in the 80s, they can feel like they're, they're, they're deliberately throwing every piece of 80s nostalgia in your face. Uh, what was the kind of line that you, you, you drew? Like, wh where did you kind of pick what to include or what not to include to not make mm. it seem too... I b I've been doing only movies that, until this and Suspiria, that were set in the present time, more or less. Um, and, um, of course, the canon of the period film is something that uh, allures me a lot. But I always thought that the period movie has to be made as if it's not a period movie. Uh, you have to try to make something as if you are doing in the, ma in the moment that where the movie is set. So uh, I, I wanted to make a movie, a, a movie set in the, 80, in the 80s that were contemporary, a contemporary movie set in 1983. I, um, we made a lot of extensive uh, visual research, and I, I asked the, a collaborator to uh, try to find pictures, family pictures from families in Crema, albums that were from the 80s, and he collected like 3,000 pictures, and we were really looking at them, were fantastic. And you can see the behavior, the faces, the, the atmosphere of, from the way these people were making pictures of their holidays or even simple things like a, bre bre uh, like a birthday or things like that. And uh, we tried to stick to that. So it wasn't about uh, our idea of the 80s, but almost like as if we were in the 80s. And the book was set in 88, so then you changed the date to 83 for the film. What was behind that decision? I like... I like I, I said it today, I think it's interesting that 83, at least in, in Italy, is probably the last year before the rampant uh, hedonism of the Reagan era poisoned the well of the world. And um, yeah, it did. It was Thatcher and Reagan, and it was a catastrophe that we are paying now. And... Um, and I can, I, can, I, can, I can be specific, but that's not the place. But, you know, Theresa May and Donald Trump. Uh, um, and so uh, we, we thought that it was interesting to see a moment in which probably that is the last summer that will be like that. And maybe it's never going to be like that again. Yeah. Do you think there's a shift in how Italian audiences will see the film compared to American audiences? Are there, are there particularly, is there a particular moment in time that you think Italians will, will see in a way that we, we perhaps wouldn't see? Uh, well, that's, uh, uh, it's a no mystery to, for the people who follow my work, uh, in Italy in particular, to know that I have a very spiky relationship with the Italian uh, industry. And, audience. I don't know. I don't know. They will f probably they will think that this is a sort of uh, dream of an American, but I am uh, Italian anyway. <laughs> and your next film is Suspiria, which seems very uh, different to the films you've seen you do before. You were saying about problems with finances before trying to push this film in certain ways. When you're making a, a remake of a massive horror movie, uh, did you have more input from people trying to, to mess with what it might be? No, no, I've been in absolute command of what I wanted to do. And my partners in Suspiria were extraordinary in giving me whatever uh, freedom I needed. The funny thing is that the movie is two hours and 43 minutes, and they like it. <laughs> I think we're opening up to some questions from the audience now. Um, I think there should be some volunteers. I think Pichi Me should get the first. <laughs> There's a mic coming. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for this film. I can't remember the last time I've been so moved by a work of art, and so thank you for this. Um, I was wondering about the last shot specifically. It was so touching and so intimate. Um, I was wondering how um, you would have directed uh, such an introspective scene, and also to you how you could have acted such a pure scene. 
Uh, well, uh, for me, it's, it's, very, it's, it's factual. Like, we know what is uh, the, 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 the path of Elio until then. We shot this almost at the end of the film. Um, I thought tonally we know because we, have the song, we already had the song of Sufjan Stevens that we already knew we were going to put then there. So we knew tonally what was the mood. Um, it was more difficult to stage the mother and Mafalda around the table doing the things they had to do than actually... I, I think I only said to you, and it's not a joke, it's true, let's make different versions, like one without tears, one half tearful, and the one very tearful. That was the direction, yeah? Yeah, and just to add on to that, we had the, we had the song uh, in advance. I, I literally have the song playing in my ear as we're doing it, because I had a little earpiece, so, you know, there was an ability to kind of chart out. Um, it felt like an acting exercise or something, just to kind of channel whatever was happening in, in the song at that moment. And it just felt like an, um, it just felt like the symbolization of Andre Osman's source material and the opportunity to do it all justice in one moment. And that's the, the grief and the happiness and the sadness and the sense of relationship loss that comes at the end of the movie and also a little hope or um, whatever, whatever the audience interprets uh, Ellie was going through in that moment. Um, but, but I said to Luca earlier today, we've been trying to figure it out, he added that scene really close to the production of the movie. And I always like to say, if I had known that we were going to do that scene four or five weeks in advance, it never would have made it in there because I would have been shaking while we were doing it. The idea of like a, a camera that close and to try to cover the trajectory of the relationship or something, but something that was added towards, towards the beginning of the production, it, we weren't, I, w I wasn't very aware that it was going to be a, like a long a close thing, and by the time we did it, it, it seemed like it was over, so. Um, and like Lucas said, again, I can't overstate it, especially working at a young age, to, to have any sort of freedom, any sort of rope is such a luxury, and I felt like Army and I really had a lot of rope to play, and certainly if it fell out of the boundaries of the character of the story, Luca was there to pull us back in. There was always a standard of truthfulness that we had to get to, but the, the amount of rope we had to, to play with was was a uh, was really a, a a privilege. I think there's a question over there. Yeah, hi. Um, I want to echo the thanks for this film. My question is around. Um, I think, to me, one of the most radical parts of the film is the body and the movement and how sex is depicted. Um, and I just wanted, without making anyone uncomfortable, <laughs> I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the body language and the choices you made around expressing desire and I thought the vulnerability of both your bodies was really like unparalleled so I'm, I'm just wondering from director and actor if you could speak to that a little bit <laughs> um, well um, I, I had we, a great complice in the divine <laughs> uh, Julia Piersanti the costume designer uh, so those lovely hot pants that she designed were perfect that's the, I, and then they, yeah. You, um, we shot on one lens, and I, 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 my, my theory, I don't know if you agree with this, is because they were, these were wider scenes, there is a physical element at play that you would see more typically in a, in, a, in a stage production of something. And certainly one of the things for me with film acting has always been like, okay, well, if it's this close, you know, you bring it down. But if your whole body's in the shot, then, and, and, and there's a lot of sexual tension and romantic tension, you know, it lends itself a lot to play with. I always like the scene where they consummate their love for the first time, they're smoking a cigarette outside first, and we walk through the hallway, and I like when we get back in the room, and it's just like, ah, you know, it's like an awkward wrestling sort of thing going on, because Elio wants him, but doesn't really know how to do it yet. Um, so, um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, so much of, of this movie was about the feel, and it was about that feeling of that summer where it's hot and you're sweaty and it's sensual and everything smells great. And it just, so much of this movie was about, at least as I saw it, capturing that essence and getting that in. And 
so much about the Oliver character was how much he actually lived in his body. You know, I mean, he's a very sort of languid, sexual, sensual kind of person. And in uh, as much as he's willing to accept that about himself, but it, it just was about the feeling of freedom. And it was about the feeling of totally just letting go and, and giving into this amazing vibe. Um, I remember the first time we had a wardrobe fitting, I put on a pair of the shorts and I was like, where's the rest of them? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then honestly, by the end of the movie, once I took those shorts off for the final time, I went home and I probably put on a pair of my own shorts and I was like, oh, there's so much fabric on my <laughs> legs. <you know? laughs> Question of the Hi. Um... Once again, congratulations. The movie was really uh, faithful to the book, so really, I loved it. Uh, my question is to you, Luca. I wanted to know why you used um, so much like wider short compared to close-ups um, during the tension and sensual scenes. Uh, well, I I think that the close-up uh, is a very important thing and it, it needs to be used uh, carefully and wisely. And I also think that uh, the, the challenge of my work and the beauty of it is to see people in motions and what they call the, um, the rhythm of the scene, which has to do with the, with the blocking. I like that very much. It's difficult, it's not easy, but... Um, it's nice to challenge yourself, and when you have great collaborators, I tell you a little story. We were to shoot the scene in which uh, the, the two speak about the monument of the World War the First Memorial, and they, about uh, their feelings in a way. And we had like how much? Six, seven pages script, and um, and we get there, and and we are thinking about the scene, and I'm kind of struggling because the day is only one, and uh, it's a very long scene, we need to find the right bits for what has to be said. And I think you said, Army, why don't we do it in one take? And I said, ah, that's not a bad idea, it's a great idea. And so we started to block the scene, and we managed to space the way it were, they were walking into the square. So once we saw Oliver and Elio in the square, it was relatively easy to then place the camera and know where to stop and what to grab. It was great. So I think that how I, first of all, collaboration, and second of all, it's people, figuring the space is more important than anything else for me. And I think that scene where you don't have any close-ups tells you so much about them. So much. It's so revelatory, revelatory of, uh, of Elio and Oliver in that moment of the film. And we have no close-ups, right? Mm. Any questions? One down here. Uh, yeah, it was an absolutely beautiful film. Uh, congratulations to everybody uh, who participated. And I'm interested in um, your relationship with uh, James Ivory and, and, and the screenplay, because I understand he wrote you guys have to answer this one. I never met, I didn't meet James. So, uh, particularly uh, uh, from a directing point of view, your uh, collaboration and your, the way you, uh, if at all, the extent to which you collaborate. Well, I met James uh, uh, when he came to Italy to show The White Countess, which is the last movie he made uh, with the legendary producer and his lifetime companion, Ismail Merchant. Then he, pa he passed away during the production of that film. And, and we bonded very strongly, me and Ivory. Um, I'm attracted by directors, not actors, in my life. So I have a lot of director's friends, and my partner is a director himself. Uh, uh, so for me, it's easy. And, and this friendship, this uh, familiarity led us to spend a lot of time together. And, uh, and one day, we were talking about Call Me By Your Name, and we said, why don't we try to imagine what would be our take on it? So in, and we started to work on the script as a moonlight thing, like really like for the pleasure of doing it and to be together between Kremen and New York. And then a year later, we got the script. Yeah. Question over there. 
Um, speaking on the book, uh, during production, was, was the book present on set? Was it in your trailer? The book, like the book? or the author of the book? The Both. Book. Both, <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, were you guys on, like... Andre is in the movie. Andre oh, okay. Yeah. But did, did you guys like, um, would you go and read prose and, and try and no. embody that? Or you just go straight from the script? Uh, no, uh, uh, I, I had the privilege of meeting the great master Bernardo Bertolucci when I was 25 and we started a lovely relationship. And, and one day I sent him the script of my, I think, second feature. And, and then I called him back and said, what do you think? And he said, Luca, you're so naive. Script, they don't count. You have to throw the script when you start the movie. And I took the lesson by the letter. I don't really particularly keep attention to the script, let alone the book. It's not about that. It's the essence of the book that we need to translate. And then Nassiman came on set and he was so happy because he was seeing Oliver and Elio. For him it must be difficult because they are in his imagination and then they are physically present. Uh, but it was great, yeah. Also a little, <clears throat> little tidbit, Andre Asman, who was in our movie, I don't, know, I don't even know if I'm supposed to be saying this, but he basically told Luca while we were filming and while he was over there, he was like, Luca, I have to tell you, I like the ending of your script almost better than my book. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Any more questions? One hand. A gentleman over there. <clears throat> Hi there, congratulations on the film. I feel so bad, everybody else is praising it. I have not seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I just saw the trailer just before you came on. Um, can you talk more about Michael Stolberg and his role and how you guys worked with him on the film? Well, Michael, well, Michael plays uh, Mr. Perlman, so um, he's Elio's father. And, and Lucas said it best today, we were talking about it earlier, we got the chance to hang out with Michael again at Sundance, and it's like we met him for the first time because it was no longer Mr. Perlman. It was the, he, he was working on Fargo, so it's whoever he was playing in Fargo. Um, but I will say there's like a certain empathy and awareness and love and melancholy to Mr. Perlman that is so wonderfully illustrative in, in, um, that to capture with an actor would have, was like, I don't think you guys could have found anybody better than Michael because he just gets it all. And that last monologue in the movie is, I haven't had a lot of experiences acting with people where you like, you really like lock in or, or something. But I remember we did a take and then I really like, we, I, I couldn't leave his eyes because it just felt like it was coming from his, coming from his heart. It might have been Luke who said it earlier today too that sometimes the, the strongest drama is when the right thing is done. And that, that, that moment is like almost oppressively right. It's at Sundance, some, someone raised their hand and said, you know, that's, that's the father I never had. And, uh, and I guess there was an awareness while we were working on the movie, certainly because the book was popular with so many people that we were making something that was, was gonna be special. But it's, it's, it's gone beyond that for me when I hear people that are so moved by it and almost changed. That's, it's almost what you, what you dream of when you wanna make movies or, or be an artist, whatever that means. But the question was about Michael, man. What am I talking? <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> Thanks. Any more questions? <laughs> On the name? Hi. Um, what was the most enjoyable or the most rewarding part of the, the film for you to shoot? It would be so hard to pick one thing, but I can honestly say I've never, I've never had the privilege or pleasure of working on a film that I feel like challenged me so much or working with people, including Timmy and, and Michael, who can't be here, but who, who also challenged me in a way where it felt so completely symbiotic. It felt like we were all one family there. We were all going through this and we were all doing it together. <clears throat> there wasn't any sort of hierarchy. There wasn't any sort of 
these people over there, these people over there. It, it just, it all felt like we were in a way living out the experience that is on, on screen. Uh, th this movie is sort of my big summer romance. Like, I mean, when anyone's like, did you have an experience like this? I was like, yeah, making the movie. It was just like what you're seeing, but better. Because we got to do it seven days a week. I mean, it was, it was truly such a special experience to make this movie. I mean, I know this, this sounds so ridiculous now, but I mean, I, I, I can't imagine my life moving forward past this movie where I don't carry that with me in a way. So we have a final question down here. Hi, um, I didn't read the book, so this may be a silly question, but I found the use of language, foreign language, in the movie um, almost another character. Um, and I just loved how there was a seamless use of language. There's a French, Italian, even German, English. Um, so I'm just wondering if you want to speak to that, and, and did everyone's foreign languages improve? Like <laughs> <laughs> you did a brilliant job. Well, um, I mean, I, I, I like, uh, there is a word, like, it, nowadays it's all about globalism, but I, there was some, there, is, there, there was cosmopolitanism that was fantastic. I like, I like cosmopolitanism, and uh, mm. my mom is Algerian, so she, her, she speaks Arab and French, also Italian, of course, but she, because she's been living for many, many years. But I, for me, it's almost normal to have a switching from a language to another. Uh, I, I admire that very much in, other, in people who can do that. And uh, I love the Perlmans. It's, I, I, it's interesting because this is not a movie about a bunch of privileged people. Actually, it's a movie about a family who is so part of the, of, of the world and of the life that they really are part of everything that moves and, and breathes. And so they, can, they really can understand uh, and they can really welcome in cultures from any kind, of, of any kind and, and culture, like culture is something of a great value for them. And language and languages, it's a way to drive culture, yeah, and acceptance. And uh, yeah, it was, it was it, the, that I like very much, that they could, they could swap. And I, I mean, we work with Amira Kazar, that is, this fantastic French actress, and also British and Iranian, who uh, mm, uh, had this great capacity of language. So, and, and Timmy is all French, and Esther Garel is French. So we wanted it to be as, as vivid as possible from that perspective. Um, also, uh, like, uh, casting of a movie, it's something that brings the opportunity of uh, putting together personalities and backgrounds and histories that are completely different from one another and make them clash and see what happens. So you have Army Hammer, this great Hollywood actor, and then you have the really like this beautiful budding flower that is Timothy, and then you have the daughter of the legendary uh, uh, director, French director, Philippe Garel, which is part of the aristocracy of the great auteur cinema of France. The, the grandfather Maurice is one of great actor. And she brings that experience, uh, Michael Stuhlberg, which comes with a different perspective from the canon of the American cinema. This mixture of things is great, and it's much better to use them for their specificity instead of make them be the same thing. I'd like to thank Luca, Army, and Timothy for coming along today and urge you all to see the film if you haven't seen it already. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. No, Luca, I'm going to share it. I should see this great after. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Starting right now in conference room B, Adobe hosts an exciting micro session on the art of the edit. And at 4.30, please join us for an inspiring conversation with award-winning producer and mogul Cassian Elwis for stories from the industry's front lines. You will not want to miss it, trust me. Enjoy.